Hey, this is Chuck from Monocoque Metalworks. I'm sitting here this afternoon on the frame table. As you can see, I'm in my new designer jeans. Usually when I film these videos, I try to put on something a little nicer, but this is what I usually look like. You know, the kids today love these. I, I can make these here too. Anyway, today's video is going to talk to you about putting together the floors and inner sills. This is the next part in a series that we're doing about how to put together the hidden subframe. But in telling you how to do the hidden subframe, I really have to tell you how to do the whole thing. And a lot of what I'm gonna to mention today used to be a close guarded secret of mine, but the reality is we can only do a few E-types a year here. We're a small company and we service a lot more than that by selling parts. And I really want to make sure that the work that's getting done at home is getting done right because with a few basic facts and a few tips, you can really turn this job around and do a lot better job. This is our frame table and jigs. It took me two years of work days, nights, and weekends to build them. I used to be worried about people replicating them, but once I figured out, you know, once I got done building them, I just realized you would have to be insane to try to do that. I wanted a perfect set of templates that I could go to for any part of the E-Type when I was restoring these bodies. All the bodies are rusted, wrecked, twisted, and you need to get them back into shape. And I went through that exercise mostly to have a reference point of what's right, what was original. But you can do the job at home with just a few basic tools on a nice flat surface. That's why I put this piece of plywood up here on top of the base floor jigs because you're not going to have all this at home but with a flat tabletop type surface and a few other things you can get this job done right no problem those things are number one a good straight edge it doesn't have to be the most costly valuable straight edge i think this one came from home depot it's a four footer we've got a six footer back there you need a straight edge a decent square is invaluable. You're gonna need a square as well. But the most important thing you need is this guy right here, a tape measure. You just keep measuring, measuring, double check, triple check. That's how you do it. Part of building the jigs was so I didn't have to keep measuring every car a hundred times as I went through it. But when you're doing it at home, there's no trouble with doing it this way. All right. In our last video, we were prepping the floors and the inner sills. I guess we'll start over here with the inner sills. We welded in the uh, engine frame brackets up front here, and we spot welded them just like they do at the factory. We showed you how they had these two locating holes with bolts in them. We pulled those out and plug welded those with the MIG. At home, you're not going to have the heavy-duty spot welder, so you can just MIG around here. That'll be fine. And then on the back side, we, I guess I'll flip this around this way. We put in our hidden subframe tubing. This is going to be inside the sill. You're never going to see it. It adds a ridiculous amount of strength and stiffness to the car. Little bit of weight, but it's well worth it. And that weight is down at the floor line, so it's actually lowering the center of gravity with the weight that it does add. Now, we now have, earlier today, sprayed weld-through primer on this seam here. You can see that we are going to tuck the inner sills under the floor. People do it both ways. Now, if you keep in mind, originally, the floor and the inner sill were all one piece. This wasn't a spot-welded seam. This was a 90 degree bend. And that's why they rust out along here really bad. Any 90 degree bend like that is stretching the metal. So you're already thinning it out a little bit right there. These floors and inner sills are 18 gauge nowadays. Originally they were a little thinner at 19 gauge. So you've got this, this seam. And again, there are differing opinions of whether or not you should put this under like this or over like this. Well, I can tell you that these were designed 
to be put under. And we know that because we have contour gauges that we've developed over the past decade of every part of the car. This is the one for the inner sill. And we know from this gauge that the inner sills of this manufacturer are too long in this dimension. And so they're about a quarter inch too long and you're either gonna have that extra material sticking out the side, but most likely it ends up sticking out the bottom. So you don't wanna make that problem worse by putting this on the top. If you put this on the bottom, you're already taking away maybe a third of that problem. So definitely put these on the bottom when you put these over here. Now, I wanna back up and talk about how you're gonna lay out your floors. Now you can see that the floor on the left hand side is stepped down to where it's going to overlap with the other floor. Again, these floors are not made by us. I do give this manufacturer a lot of grief for the quality of their parts, but I'm a very honest guy. I always tell it like it is, and I have to say they make a great floor. And so the floors are good. It's okay to use these. They didn't originally have this step. They just overlap the two pieces. And that actually works out a little better under here for the tie plate, but it's fine. They have this step now. Now, what people will do to get into big trouble on these floors, there is a very common piece of knowledge out there that you put the floors together so that these two edges are exactly 48 inches apart. That may or may not have been true originally, but with the variances in the edge of the floor and also the fact that the location of this edge is totally irrelevant. That doesn't matter. It's not going to hurt you if it's wider or narrower. There are other things that are much more important. Number one, the radius cups are already drilled out on here. We've put the radius cups on and we showed that in the previous episode, how we use solid rivets and use the TIG to melt the top of that rivet right into this plate. The radius cup threaded holes on the bottom are exactly 36 inches on center. And so you wanna lay this out on a flat surface and put them 36 inches on center. Hang on, stay there, I'll flip this over. The video is not exactly going in the order I wanted, but that's okay. What you don't want to do is what a lot of people do. They get really hung up about lining up this hole perfectly, lining this up on this seam perfectly, and then also lining up these holes to where they were. Don't worry about that. That is not important. What is important are Three things, all right? Number one, radius cup holes, 36 inches on center, exactly. Number two, I don't know what this measurement is, I should, but you wanna take your original reaction plate and put it in here and set these so that this just fits between there perfectly. Not tight, not loose. Make sure this is nice and straight and square here. It's not, you know, this will get all banged up in shipping or whatever. Make sure that's nice and straight and make sure this fits that just perfect. All right, that's number two. And number three is to just make sure the whole nine yards is straight and flat and square. You know, don't put these 36 inches apart like this or like this and have that fit kind of cockeyed. You know, draw on your table or whatever so that these are in a square line. This comes up. Make note that these main floor runners are not parallel to the, to the edges of the floor. These things go out like this, all right? So, 36 inches on center, reaction plate fits just perfectly, and then you'll usually find that this is just about right. Um, it may be a little off or whatever, and you may have to grind out these little holes later on in the process, that's okay. Whatever this lands at, it's okay. It doesn't matter, because the way the 
the inner sill comes like this and then the outer sill comes around, this all gets covered up and it doesn't matter if it moves around in there a little bit, but you're gonna be in big trouble if your reaction plate doesn't fit, your radius cups are in the wrong spot or the whole thing isn't square. All right. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I know I'm yelling and I'm talking really fast, but I'm kind of wound up. I've got my afternoon coffee here. Um, but moving forward, all right, we have sprayed the weld through primer. We showed you where it was on the inner sill, and now you can see that we've sprayed it to the underside of the floor here, all right? Now, this is your jack mount. And you'll see that it's spaced out and there's a gap here. And that gap is especially wide because again, this is all designed for the inner sill to go on the bottom. Now your inner sill and the outer sill, which you wanna buy here, if you only buy one thing here, make sure it's the outer sill. Um, they're both 18 gauge. Now these are actually two 16 gauge shims, but you can see it's got the space for the two layers to go right in there. So, that's how you're gonna tuck those together, all right? Now I have this floor upside down, so I wanna show you back here on the tie plate. We do use a factory tie plate. Um, this is the tie plate that comes from the other supplier. Actually, the guys that make this floor, it is too wide. Now you might think, all right, what's the big deal? It's too wide. Well, the problem is when you go ahead and put it on there, it runs into the seat rails. because This sits about here. All right, yeah, right about there. So our tie plate is of course identical to the original and it is the perfect width. And you can see where when you line it up with the back of the floor, it fits just perfectly. I don't know why they don't do it like that. So we've put two heavy coats of a nice etch primer on here. It's really grabbed the metal. Then you can see where this was taped with masking tape. I peeled the masking tape off after spraying the etch in there. And then this area where our flanges are is sprayed with weld through primer. Same thing here, I, I taped this, I sprayed etch all in here, nice heavy coat, then put some weld through on top, all right? This is the masking tape that we use. This is the standard scotch stuff. This stuff used to say edge lock on it, now it says sharp lines, but it's blue with green lettering. There is, this is a low stick tape. There is another, um, level of this product, which is like super low stick. And it typically has blue with yellow lettering. Don't get that. I don't know what it is about the super low stick glue, but it rusts the metal. The glue in this does not. So use the blue with the green letter. This is the weld through primer that we use. There are only a couple different manufacturers. We used to use the 3M. I have found that the 3M is much more unforgiving when you're doing MIG welding around the weld through. They both seem to work about the same for the spot welding, which is what this is designed for, but this works a lot better uh, for the uh, MIG welding. It does smell weird, but it seems to be a little less toxic too. All right, so this is, that's gonna go under there. So, this is gonna get lined up here. And again, you're supposed to tell people things three times to make it stick. 36 inches, perfect fit on the reaction plate, everything nice and square. And then you wanna come down here, we're gonna do two rows of an industrial spot weld, but you can do plug welding and put a few little stitches along here on the MIG if you want. Don't worry about this lining up perfectly. Don't worry about the locations for these right now. And don't worry about this outer edge being a perfect four feet. That doesn't matter. The one last thing we were gonna show you is that another thing about this edge, they use a nibbling shear to cut this. And you can see where it's always a real jagged edge. You don't really need to worry about that too much because when you're, uh, inner sill is gonna come in there, that, that's kind of irrelevant. 
But come around here, one thing I do want you to do is that you'll see because of the nibbling, they end up with these little nerds sticking out. See right there? All right, you got right there. And then back here, you got more of them. Make sure you just come along here, right, right there. Yeah, you, make sure you come along here with a sanding disc and at least smooth that out. All right, so let's go ahead and we're gonna take this piece of wood off we do have a jig that's all, the only difference is it's already all lined up and square, but you can do that manually at home. So we're gonna bolt this down and start spot welding things together. Okay, you can see now I've got the floors all bolted into the jig and they all lined up great. That hole there is not perfect. And this little edge here is a little closer in the back than it is in the front but everything else that's important is where I want it to be. I've clamped this down tight. These floors come through nice and flat now. If you have an older pair, they're gonna be wavy here, but you'll probably be plug welding with a MIG. You'll put enough heat in to shrink it down a little and it'll be fine. I'm gonna go ahead and just show you guys a couple of spot welds. We've got the pump, the cooling pump turned off because you know it's deafening. So I can only do a couple. You can see where I am going to do two spot welds every inch and a quarter. That's the spacing that I like. And I've marked out where I'm putting them because like I said, when you're welding, it gets a little crazy. All right, here we go. And that was a pretty good flash on that one. All right, here comes the other one. more here and we'll turn the pump on. See, sometimes they don't splatter at all. It just depends on how the tips line up and they line up a little bit different every time as you can see. All right. All right. Let's turn on that pump. All right. We now have the tie plate clamped in place. It is underneath here, and we are gonna go ahead and spot weld this in as well. Now you can see where first I put it up top, I found the center, and I centered it up, and I traced it out, and then made some marks of where my spot welds are gonna be. Now, at home, you would probably be plug welding, and you'd be doing it from the bottom. But this just goes to show you, you know, you're gonna be doing a lot of mapping out. If you were plug welding, you'd be mapping to drill the holes for your plug welds, etc. So it's good to think of all that stuff in advance as you're going along so that you don't get hung up and find something tacked into place and now you gotta drill a whole bunch of holes later. Okay, next we are laying out the cross member. Now we're not gonna put this in right now, but we do need to lay it out because at this point I like to weld in the piece of hidden subframe tubing that goes inside the cross member. So this is how we beef up the car. Now this is your center piece. This is a separate piece and you're gonna put that on after you get the cross member in. All right, so let's just set that aside for a second. All right, here's the cross member. You can see again, I've primed the inside and I've got my weld through on the flanges. Now here, you see a whole bunch of lines I have laid out what is going to happen here. Here's the outer edge of my cross member. Here's the inner edge, all right? And then this is my trace line of the tubing. And then stepped in from that an eighth of an inch is my line to tape because the tubing is curved on the bottom and we're gonna put that weld right in there. So I don't want the, I don't want the primer too close to my tubing weld. And then after I weld the tubing in, I will take the primer again and just squirt all in there. And so it'll all flow into that little section. So I like to weld this piece of tubing on now before I put the inner sills on because I, I like to be able to get right in there, see it well. I'm able to lean over the assembly and get it done. But you could put the inner sills on and then put the tubing in. Um, it, you know, it could work out either way. 
Okay, we're all clamped down now. And I've marked again where I'm gonna weld so I don't have to think about it later while I'm doing it. These are my little weld zones. You don't need to go crazy on this. You're just attaching it to the floor. And if you over weld it and put too much weld in there, you're gonna shrink that tube a little bit and curve it some. So you don't wanna do that. You just want it well attached. And I always have to guard against that. I, I wanna go crazy on this thing like a roll cage. But again, you're just attaching it to the floor. All right, this piece of tubing is now welded to the floor. You can see I've done bigger welds, and then here in the middle, I've put a couple smaller ones. Again, I didn't want to put too much in there. And you still got a little contamination coming out of the welds, but the welds themselves look pretty good. And we're gonna clean that up now and prime it. Right here, the floor drooped a little bit, and I didn't catch it till I had already started welding it so i stopped cut the weld out and smoothed out the floor and pulled the floor up and re-welded it so just take your time and if you run into a little problem stop and fix it okay i now have the inner sills mounted up in the jig and they are attached to the floor you can see i've got them in the jig up front and then they're attached to the floor back here. Now you may be concerned about getting this placement right if you don't have a jig, and you should be concerned. Let me zoom in a little bit. I'm talking about the placement of these uh, lower engine frame brackets. However, if you use R brackets and you use these readily available floors and inner sills, um, that is gonna line up just fine, even without a jig. They're, they're kind of self-locating. I mean, I put the brackets on the inner sills and then I fitted the inner sills up to the floor and just mashed it right up again. See how it's, it's tight up in there? See, it's just right tight up in there. And then I just put the um, bolts through from our jig, just finger tight, I mean, you know, it was easy. I didn't have to wedge anything into place or anything. So, and that's been the case with the last half dozen. They really will line right up where they need to be. And then you can fit that on your end. You can use your frame rails to check, you know, the distance between that big mount down in here and then over here. You probably should build some type of rudimentary jig on your firewall before you take the car apart. Uh, I'll probably do another video about that later on but anyway we are all mounted up sometimes you will get some curvature here and i use ratchet straps i fish them through these holes you can see that hole's a little bent and i will hammer and dolly it back but i've put some screws in here and i'll come back and drill them out and plug weld them later just to hold everything tight and straight before i go ahead and do the spot welding and that is what I am going to do now. The last thing I want to tell you is the, the right angle here, this, this fit right there. See how that's not quite a right angle? I'm just about, and see how it's not a, not a perfect fit there. I'm just about to come along with a hammer and dolly and just flatten that out nicely before I do the spot welding. Our big spot welder will pull that right down. It'll pull things tighter than a vice grip. But I don't want that wavy effect. I would have to hammer and dolly it later anyway. So you want to get that nice and straight and flat before you go ahead and do your spot or plug welding. Okay, we've now welded the outer ends of this piece of tubing to the inner sills using the MIG. There's a weld right there. And we've also pulled those screws out and drilled those holes out a little bit and welded up those um, screw holes, turned them into plug welds. So now we're going to put the cross member, which is the, the factory cross member, over top of this and hide our hidden subframe. Here it is. Now, we don't have those tabs on the end that they had originally. We prefer to MIG this straight to the sill there, and obviously this isn't in place, but we will butt this up. This was typically 
20 gauge from the factory, we make it in 18. So it's a little stronger. And then the inner sills are 18 and we just MIG that joint right to each other. Now you'll see this is too long, just like with the cross member halves, you wanna trim this down until it just slides in there and is a perfect fit so that you can get the best weld that you can. And I will trim this three or four times, just, just trying to zero in on that perfect fit. Okay, I've got the cross member in now, and you can see where I have welded the edges directly to the inner sill with a MIG. And then you see I've got all my markings because I like to have things ready to go when I'm especially spot welding because, you know, battling this thing with one guy is tough. And I'm here by myself this afternoon. Um, and now we are going to put in the center brace. And you can see where I've already spot welded all the way across here. The uh, Sharpie marker marks come right through that uh, weld through primer. And so we've got that there, and then here is our centerpiece. It does not have the nuts on it yet. I like to put the nuts on at the end. So this will go right over there like that. We will line it up in the center. I think I just about nailed it, just setting it there. And now that will get spot welded in along the back and the front. And then I will drill out these holes. The holes underneath that come in the floors are bigger and like I said, they may or may not be in the perfect spot. I think this time they were. And then we will go ahead and run a bolt and a nut through there and just make that nut on from the top. And then this assembly will be done. So I'll give you one last look at it when it's all done. Okay, this assembly is all done. This is gonna be pulled out and is going to a customer as is for them to go ahead and finish this at home. So you can see we've got the engine frame brackets on there. They're exactly where they should be. We've got the hidden subframe tubing in there for strength. There's another piece of that under here. Everything's been spot welded, just like the factory on this one. Oh, see, I thought I was done, but I forgot to put those nuts in there. So I'll drill those out and put those nuts in there. Hang on. All right, I welded in the nuts. Just ran some bolts up through there and put the nuts on after I drilled them out and then just tacked them in there with the MIG. All right, so here's the other side. There's that tubing on that side. All right. We did not put in the gussets because it'll really help the customer to be able to just wiggle this around a little bit. And then in the back, there would be another piece of the tubing in here, but we don't know exactly where their uh, rear chassis legs are gonna come down. And so we're gonna let him set that in place after he goes ahead and mates this up with what's left of his body. So there it is. I hope you've learned how to do it and how you can do it at home. But if you think that's a little beyond what you want to do, and if you really just want to have it jigged up like we do it here, give us a ring. We can make one of these for you, or we could supply any of the parts or really anything you need for your E-type body shell reconstruction. Thanks for watching.